Social Amnesia, a critique of conformist psychology from Adler to Lang by Russell Jacoby. This is chapter one, Social Amnesia and the New Ideologues. The history of philosophy is the history of forgetting. So T.W. Adorno has remarked, problems and ideas once examined fall out of sight and out of mind only to resurface later as novel and new. If anything, the process seems to be intensifying. Society remembers less and less, faster and faster. The sign of the times is thought that has succumbed to fashion. It scorns the past as anti antiquated while touting the present as the best. Psychology is hardly exempt. What was known to Freud, half remembered by the Neo-Freudians, is unknown to their successors. The forgetfulness itself is driven by an unshakable belief in progress. What comes later is necessarily better than what came before. Today, without romanticizing the past, one could almost state the reverse. What is new is worse than what is old. The celebration of the present is aided by instant history. Today's banalities apparently gain in profundity if one states that the wisdom of the past, for all its virtues, belongs to the past. The arrogance of those who come later preens itself with the notion that the past is dead and gone. Few can resist introducing stock criticism of Freud, be it of the left or right, without the standard observation that Freud was a 19th century Viennese. The endless repetition of such statements suggests the decline of critical thinking. The modern mind can no longer think thought, only can locate it in time and space. The activity of thinking decays to the passivity of classifying. Freud is explained away by positioning him in a 19th century Vienna. Today, bred and fed on 20th century urbane and liberal feed, we have apparently left behind history itself and can view the past with the pleasure of knowing that we are no longer part of it. Yet little bears the imprint of the present historical period more than this fake historical consciousness. The argument that past thought is past because it is past is a transparent alibi for the present. To accuse such reasoning with its own logic, it is the contemporary form of relativism debased sociology of knowledge seeks to avoid thought by mechanically matching it with specific social strata in historical eras. Its awareness of historical transformation ideologically stops short of itself. Its own viewpoint is considered neutral and absolute truth, outside, not inside, history. The critique of Freud is hopelessly situated in Vienna, and the 19th century unites cultural anthropologists, neo-Freudians, and theoreticians of women's liberation. Aside from those who joyfully or maliciously rewrite his hi history and have it that Freud was merely the vanguard of the sexual mythology of his time, or worse, it is repeated endlessly that he was a genius, but like all geniuses bound and blinded by his era. Not even a genius, wrote Karen Horney of Freud, can entirely step out of his time. He was part of his era in that in the 19th century, there was little, no little knowledge regarding cultural differences. Freud ascribed to biology what today we know is due to culture. Or as Clara Thompson wrote, although a genius, Freud was in many respects limited by the thinking of his time, as even a genius must be. Specifically, much which Freud believed to be biological has been shown by modern research to be a reaction to a certain type of culture. Patrick Mulahy Mulahi wrote, Freud could not surmount certain limitations of his culture and of his own nature. This was inevitable. Even a genius can do only so much. In particular, Freud's intellectual framework, his whole orientation, is a mechanistic, materialistic one. Freud grew up in the second half of the 19th century, when scientific men generally espoused a philosophy of mechanistic materialism. Or, more recently, Betty Friedan remarked to Freud that even his genius could not give him 
then the knowledge of cultural processes, which is common knowledge today. It should be noted that the recent insight that psychoanalysis is a product of 19th century Vienna is as recent as 1914, when it was, when it was already old. Freud wrote then, We have all heard the interesting attempt to explain psychoanalysis as a product of the peculiar character of Vienna as a city. This inspiration runs as follows. Psychoanalysis, so far as it consists of the assertion that the neuroses are traceable to disturbances in the sexual life, could only have come to birth in a town like Vienna, and it simply contains a reflection, a projection, into theory, as it were, of these peculiar Viennese conditions. Now, honestly, I am no local patriot, but this theory about psychoanalysis always seems to me quite exceptionally stupid. Further, Freud glimpsed the future in which calling him a genius would be the password for easing him into the clubhouse of common sense. He is recorded as saying, Calling me a genius is the latest way people have of starting their criticism of me. First they call me a genius and then they, and then they proceed to reject all my views. Today, criticism that shelves the old in the name of the new forms part of the zeitgeist. It works to justify and defend by forgetting, in making only a fleeting gesture toward the past, or none at all. Social and psychological thought turn apologetic. The heroic period of militant, materialistic, and enlightened bourgeois thought, if there ever was one, is no more. The law, once enunciated on the dwindling force of cognition in bourgeois society, can be confirmed daily. In the name of a new era, past theory is declared honorable but feeble. One can lay aside Freud and Marx or appreciate their limitations and pick up the latest at the drive-in window of thought. The syndrome is a general one. In brief, society has lost its memory and with it its mind. The inability or refusal to think back takes its toll in the inability to think. The loss of memory assumes a multitude of forms, from a radical empiricism and positivism that unloads past thought like so much intellectual baggage, to hip theories that salute the giants and geniuses of the past as unfortunates born too soon. The latter more important in the context of this book, in the impatience to contrive new and novel theories, hustle through the past as if it were the junkyard of wrecked ideas. In every era, wrote Walter Benjamin, the attempt must be made to wrest tradition away from a conformism that is about to overcome it. The general loss of memory is not to be explained solely psychologically. It is not simply childhood amnesia. Rather, it is social amnesia. Memory driven out of mind by the social and economic dynamic of this society. The nature of the production of social amnesia can barely be suggested here, such an explanation would have to draw upon the Marxist concept of reification. Reification in Marxism refers to an illusion that is objectively manufactured by society. This social illusion works to preserve the status quo by presenting the human and social relationships of society as natural and unchangeable relations between things. What is often ignored in expositions of the concept of reification is the psychological dimension amnesia, a forgetting and repression of the human and social activity that makes and can remake society. The social loss of memory is a type of reification. Better, it is the primal form of reification. All reification is a forgetting. To pursue this for a moment, this form of reification is rooted in the necessities of the economic system. The intensification of the drive for surplus value and profit accelerates the rate at which past goods are liquidated to make way for new goods. Planned obsolescence is everywhere, from consumer goods to thinking to sexuality. Built-in obsolescence exempts neither thought nor humans. What is hel heralded as new or young in things, thoughts or people, masks the constant, this society. Inherent in Marxism is the notion that dead labor dominates living things, dominate activity, 
The past commands the present. The domination of capitalist over workers is the domination of things over men, dead labor over the living, products over producers. Exactly because the past is forgotten, it rules unchallenged. To be transcended, it must first be remembered. Social amnesia is society's repression of remembrance, society's own past. It is a psychic commodity of the commodity society. The point here, though, is not to pursue an economic analysis. Rather, it is to excavate the critical and historical concepts that have fallen prey to the dynamic of a society that strips them both of their historical and critical content. In losing this content, they turn apologetic or ideological. There is an irony here, which is part of the problem. One of the very concepts formulated so as to comprehend this social process has succumbed to it. The concept of ideology. The concept of ideology is of double interest, both because the concept is used in these pages in its partially lost meaning, and because an examination of its meaning is itself a short lesson in the process and effect of social forgetting. Some 15 years ago, Daniel Bell resuscitated the concept in the end of ideology with the intent of burying it for good. He too discovered that the past was dead and gone. Ideology was obsolete. The old politico-economic radicalism has lost its meaning. Now in the Western world, there is a rough consensus among intellectuals on political issues. Bell himself was well aware that the concept of ideology possessed a distinct content in history, but his account of the history of the concept was a formal exercise. It stood in no relation to his own definitions. With Bell, as with others such as Hannah Arendt, ideology is associated with abstract sloganeering, political passion, and violence, and it is contrasted with nonviolent, good-natured empiricism and pragmatism. Ideology makes it unnecessary for people to confront individual issues on their individual merits, writes Bell. Suffused by apocalyptic fervor, ideas become weapons and with dreadful results. The method rather to be followed must be an empirical one. Arendt's argument is summed up in a chapter titled Ideology and Terror in her basic text of the Cold War, Origins of Totalitarianism. Arendt links ideology with violence and evil and contrasts it with common sense and empiricism. Ideologies are isms, which, to the satisfaction of their adherents, can explain everything <clears throat> and every occurrence by deducing it from a single premise. Ideologies claim total explanation, independent of all experience. All ideologies contain totalitarian elements. In the concluding section of the main part of her book, she tells us that the aggressiveness of totalitarianism springs not from lust for power, nor for profit, but only for ideological reasons, to make the world consistent, to prove that its respective supersense has been right. <clears throat> Several things, several things could be said about these formulations. The first, that they have been highly successful. They are deeply ingrained in the liberal consciousness, which is convinced that ideology is a form of abstract, non-empirical logic that issues into violence and terror. Secondly, despite the pretense of scholarship, they are false. The history of the concept of ideology has recently been told and need not be recounted here. It must suffice to recall that ideology, aside from its factual origins in the ideologues of the French Revolution, derives from Marx. Crucial in this context is that in Marxism, ideology is in no way restricted to what in Anglo-American tradition is considered abstract thought. Rather, it refers to a form of consciousness. False consciousness, a consciousness that has been falsified by social and material conditions. As a form of consciousness, it could include any type of knowledge, idealism, empiricism, or positivism. 
Indeed, the latter was considered the ideology par excellence of the bourgeois market and culture. England. What determined if a consciousness was false was not an a priori categorizing of the type of knowledge, but an examination of its truth, its relationship to the concrete social reality. The relevant point here is that the original Marxist notion of ideology was conveniently forgotten because it inconveniently did not exempt common sense and empiricism from the charge of ideology. The subsequent theory of ideology was directed solely against theoretical and philosophical concepts, concepts which could possibly defy common sense and empirical reality. Such concepts, not by chance, are inseparable from a radical social analysis. Dubbed ideology and saddled with all the ills of totalitarianism, they are contrasted with a healthy and godly common sense that harms no living things. Ideologies, Arendt tells us, are never interested in the miracle of being, as if the miracle ingredient of the no-nonsense logic of the market were love itself. This argument promoted the pragmatic and anti-theoretical consciousness already suspicious of theory and philosophy. The irony is that the Marxist notion of ideology was originally directed toward elucidating and articulating consciousness, but picked up by the practitioners of the sociology of knowledge and purged of its critical elements, it affected the sabotage of consciousness and not its restoration. With Bell, Arendt, and a host of others, its meaning was repressed, and a conformist one, openly or implicitly celebrating the common sense of the West, was introduced. The, the domestication and social repression of critical concepts such as ideology is the formula on which influential recent works, Alvin Toffler's Future Shock, Theodore Rosak's The Making of a Counterculture, are built. They are marked by refusal or inability to theorize in the name of a new era that is left behind traditional political categories. More exactly, new theories are advanced. End of ideology, future shock, counterculture. But these turn out to be substanceless, inasmuch as they are constructed out of only a sham confrontation with past theory. In their anxiety to leave behind the dated past, they unwittingly fall into it, advancing new labels for old ideas. Future shock can be considered the theoretical defense of this mode of operation, as well as its refutation. Its argument that each new item on the capitalist counter is a shocking addition to freedom is contradicted by the book itself, a drab repackaging of old apologetics. The reduction of social antagonism and misery to a maladjustment between people and technology is an old approach. Technology in this scheme exists in a no man's land beyond profit and exploitation. Technology accelerates, Toffler tells us, because it feeds upon itself. The supreme question which confronts our generation today, the question to which all other problems are merely corollaries, is whether technology can be brought under control, is Toffler's thesis as anticipated by the Rockefeller Foundation Review of 1943. The sleight of hand involves shifting attention from the social economic structure to supposedly neutral territory, as if today no one controls technology. Such an analysis permits enough pathos to creep in to make an enthusiasm for capitalism such as Toffler's acceptable to those who rightly think that something is seriously wrong. Rosak's analysis is made of the same stuff, though to be sure it is more critical than Toffler's barely disguised apologetics. With the others, he dismisses the vintage rhetoric of radicalism. Where the old categories of social analysis have so little to tell us, it becomes a positive advantage to confront the novelty of politics-free of outmoded ideological preconceptions. Like Toffler, he disapproves or he disproves his analysis as he makes it. He distances himself from traditional political categories by not understanding them and is led to repeat what is older yet. What he offers as new is a tired romanticism billed as racy. 
His discussion of Marcus and Brown, Marx and Freud, which comes complete with a fable that reads like an entry to a breakfast cereal contest, surpasses the old ideologies only in bypassing them. Rotzak illustrates the renewal of banality under the brand of a new profundity. The key to his thought is the Philistine romanticism that Hegel polemicized against. It warms up where there is religion, soul, and homilies, and grows cold around thought and analysis. It is not by chance that Rosak finds Antoni Antonioni's blow-up pornographic or Marcus pedestrian and waxes eloquent over Paul Goodman, comparing him to Socrates. Leaving his appraisal of Goodman aside, where there is thought and intelligence, Rosak finds banality in common sense, and where there is banality, he finds genius. He unearths with enthusiasm the intellectual division of labor as if it were buried. In this scheme, thought is a private uh, preserve for intellectuals, technocrats, and politicians, while poets and dreamers romp in the playground of art, myths, and soul. Just this filing system killed the magic that Rozak wants to remarket. The sundering of a scientific from a poetic truth is the primal mark of the administrative mind. A dialectical approach is unknown and uncomprehended by Rozak. He prefers the logic of either or. To follow his crucial political philosophical discussion for a moment, alienation is either a social or psychic phenomenon. Rozak concludes that alienation is primarily psychic, not sociological. It is not a propriety distinction that exists between men, but rather a disease that is rooted inside all men. The true students of alienation, therefore, are not social scientists, but the psychiatrists. From this, we learn that the revolution which will free us from alienation must be primarily therapeutic in character. Of course, this makes sense because the establishment would have it no other way. And coincidentally, Rosak also has learned that alienation, properly understood, has been more heavily concentrated in the upper levels of capitalist society than in its long-suffering lower depths. Not satisfied with this discovery, Rosak goes on. What bothers him is that alienation, not safely monopolized by literary and psychic repairmen, might spill over into sociology and suggest that the evil lies not in the human condition, but in inhuman conditions. Following Bell's researches on this point, Rozak assures us that alienation in Marx has only the most marginal connection with the way this idea functions in the thinking of Kierkegaard or Dostoevsky or Kafka, as if the big three on alienation copyrighted the term for the exclusive use of their dealers and customers. The reified categories that Rozak has made his own paralyze any critique that would undo reification, even his critique of the madness of science for all its justness, ends up in madness. The romantic critique of capitalism has its truth, but it is to be articulated as a social critique, not departmentalized and fetishized. The magical consciousness, the wisdom of the sensitive soul that he champions as a response to a technocratic society is its refuse, not its negation. In accepting the bourgeois form of reason as reason itself, Rosak does his bit to perpetuate its reign. The critique of sham novelty and the planned obsolescence of thought cannot in its turn flip the coin and claim that the old texts, be they of Marx or Freud, are as valid as when written and need no interpretation or rethinking. Rather, to be pursued is the very relationship between the original thought and the contemporary conditions. The blind choice of one or the other each has its adherents and has respectively revealed its consequences. Mechanical repetition has proved lethal to a Marxism that was not rethought but only restated, and it has brought bourgeois social theory to the thriving activity of publishing and forgetting. The relationship between the texts of the past and the present society is one of tension. Within Marxism, the nature of this tension is a recurring problem surfacing in discussions on revisionism and orthodoxy. The Frankfurt School has dubbed the Neo-Freudians revisionists. 
The term itself cannot be abstracted from the history of Marxism. To those outside of Marxist tradition, the terms revisionism and orthodoxy lack resonance, and even within Marxism, the terms have had such a tortured history that their present meaning is in doubt. Historically, revisionism in Germany was centered around Edward Bernstein. To the orthodox, it signified a refashioning of Marxism, which in the name of improvement junked its essence as dated. The revision was an incision that cut out the living nerve of Marxism. The Neo-Freudians and their successors no doubt willingly accept the designation insofar as they perceive the alternative as that between an authority an authoritarian orthodoxy and creative humanistic revisions. Eric Fromm sees it exactly in these terms in an essay entitled Psychoanalysis, Science or Party Line. He does not shrink from labeling Freud and the orthodox Freudians, Stalinists, out to conquer the world. Of course, the alternative is then clear. Psychoanalysis must revise from the standpoint of humanistic and dialectical thinking Many of his, Freud's, theories conceived in the spirit of 19th century physiological materialism. But the blank alternatives of orthodoxy and revisionism, or 19th century materialism and 20th century humanism, are not to be retained. In question is not dogma versus change, but the content of the change. The latter defines orthodoxy or revisionism, not the former. It can hardly be maintained that the orthodox Freudians have simply been con content to repeat Freud, fleeing any change as heresy, nor that Freud himself suppressed innovations. I am defending Grodeck energetically against your respectability, wrote Freud to the clergyman Oscar Feister. What would, what would you have said had you been a contemporary of Rabelais? From Ernest Jones's work on Hamlet and Nightmares to George Grodek's and Sander Ferenczi's studies, and more recently to Marcuse's Eros and Civilization and Norman O. Brown's Life Against Death, Freudian concepts are developed and unfolded. Next to these, the revisions, commencing with Adler's through to Horney's and Fromm's, and sustained by the myth of Freud as authoritarian in theory in person, have been marked by a monotonous discovery of common sense. Once the false opposition between orthodoxy and revisionism, as that between obsolete dogma and contemporary insight is avoided, the notion of orthodoxy must be reformulated. To the point that the theories of Marx and Freud were critiques of bourgeois civilization, orthodoxy entailed loyalty to these critiques. More exactly, dialectical loyalty. Not repetition, is called for, but articulation and development of concepts, and within Marxism, and to a degree within psychoanalysis, precisely against an official orthodoxy only too happy to freeze concepts into formulas. Revisionism was indeed change, but change that diluted and dissolved critical insights already gained. It capitulated to a reality that proclaimed itself as new and dynamic, while, statis while statically serving up more of the same. The outline of the nature of revisionism within both Marxism and psychoanalysis already emerges. In both forms, it is associated with a decline of theory per se, a refusal or inability to conceptualize. In both forms, it edged toward empiricism, positivism, pragmatism, and a rejection of theory, either of the philosophical and Hegelian content of Marxism or the meta-theory of psychoanalysis. In both forms, it sought immediate gains, one in political reforms, the other in therapy, at the expense of a non-immediate theory. To a great extent, the critique of revisionism within Marxism, at least in the pre-Stalin years, and within psychoanalysis, turned on this point. The revisionists were accused of suppressing the theory in favor of momentary gains and reforms. Rosa Luxemburg observed the hostility to theory of the revisionists. It is quite natural for people who run after immediate practical results to want to free themselves from our theory. 
in different terms to be discussed below, the same is true about psychoanalytic revisionism. Marcuse found that the tension between theory and therapy in psychoanalysis, analogous to the tension between theory and praxis in Marxism, is lost by the revisionists. And in losing this, the revolutionary and critical edge of psychoanalysis is blunted. If revisionism is marked by decline of theory, dialectical orthodoxy reworks and rethinks. In Freudian thought, however, it is difficult to find a conceptual center that locates which concepts are worthy of, re of reformulation and which are inessential. What George Lucas did for Marxism in what is orthodox Marxism has not been done for Freudianism. Yet Freud and his students are clear enough as to what in psychoanalysis is to be preserved, not by thoughtless repetition, but by reworking the concepts of repression, sexuality, unconscious, edible complex, infantile sexuality. It is no accident that two books, heretical in their scope and argument, but orthodox in their allegiance to the concepts of Freud, begin almost identically. According to Freud, runs the second sentence of Marcuse's Eros and Civilization. The history of man is the history of his repression. And Norman O. Brown's Life Against Death begins, there is one word which, if we only understand it, is the key to Freud's thought. That word is repression. Brown footnotes the sentence of Freud. The doctrine of repression is the foundation stone on which the whole structure of psychoanalysis rests, the most essential part of it. Not to be forgotten, indeed to be explained, is that the push toward immediate reforms and gains the impatience with past theory is humanist in motivation. Within psychoanalysis, exactly those who sought to make it more liberal and social cut its strength. So far as the post-Freudians make claim to humanity and sensitivity that they find lacking in psychoanalysis and behaviorism, they are to be taken seriously. Open and undisguised apologies for a lethal social order are self-critiques. The promises of liberation, however, are to be scrutinized. An illustration of this dynamic of humanist reforms versus theory is seen in the Fromm-Marcuse dispute. In 1955, Fromm called Marcuse a nihilist because unlike himself, the humanist Marcuse did not designate the concrete immediate links and gains that tied the present to the future. To Fromm, Marcuse seemed more committed to theory than practical reforms. The logic of Fromm's argument caused him to cast off as illogical the theory that seemed impractical, so as to praise immediate gains and reforms as utopia itself. This becomes evident in a recent work in which, in slightly different terms, he renews his charge that Marcuse is a nihilist. Marcuse is not even concerned with politics, for if one is not concerned with steps between the present and the future, one does not deal with politics, radical or otherwise. Fromm adds a bit of psychoanalytic wisdom to explain this situation. Marcuse is essentially an example of an alienated intellectual who presents his personal despair as a theory of radicalism. Fromm, on the other hand, unalienated and hopeful, has no difficulty finding the practical steps. The irony is that the steps that Fromm designates are not only more impractical than anything Marcuse ever discussed, but are steps which, even if practical, do less than reform. The loss of theory takes its revenge by confounding the practice that leads deeper into the society with the practice which leaves it. After a few more years of this practical policy, wrote Luxembourg about the reformists, it is clear that it, it is least practical of all. I submit, writes Fromm, that if people would truly accept the Ten Commandments or the Buddhist Eightfold Path as the effective principle to guide their lives, a dramatic change in our whole culture would take place. If this dramatic change seems unlikely or impractical, Fromm has some other ideas on how to reach the future more quickly and efficiently. The first step could be the formation of a national council, which could be called the voice of American conscience. Oh, that sounds like a nightmare. 
I think of a group of, say, 50 Americans whose integrity and capability are unquestioned. They would deliberate and issue statements which, because of the weight of those who issued them, would be newsworthy. This is only the first step. Fromm explains how clubs will be formed to help the council, then groups, and so on. All of this will alter the nature of society. The advocate of immediate practice, impatient with critical theory, turns into the homespun philosopher promoting the miracle effects of a little elbow grease. The last page of this book, The Revolution of Hope, is a tarot to be sent in with proposed candidates for the National Council of the Voice of American Conscience. Oh, that's amazing. The page, however, lacks a prepaid envelope, for as Fromm tells the reader, I have not provided a prepaid envelope. The reason follows from what is said in the book. Even the first small step requires initiative, at least, to address the envelope yourself and spend the money for a stamp. Social change for the cost of a stamp is the wisdom of the humanist denouncing as nihilism the theory exposing the postcard mentality. The Revolution of Hope is a Walt Disney production. Nihilism, wrote Marcus, as the indictment of inhuman conditions may be a truly humanist attitude. In this sense, I accept Fromm's designation of my position as human nihilism. And the new or not so new left? It is undoubtedly part of the injustice of this book that it considers as related phenomena non-political psychologies that at best claim to be liberal and humanist, and a political left and the psychology uh, of R.D. Lang and David Cooper that claim to be revolutionary. Certainly, they are not equal phenomena. A discussion of Lang and Cooper will be deferred to the final chapter. As for the political left, no matter how confused it is not to be equated with psychologies serving indifferently big business during the week and employees on the weekends. Yet they are not unrelated. Both have gravitated towards subjectivity, the person in his or her immediate emotions, as a response to a callous and indifferent society. In taking the person as the patient they have followed, society's own patent remedy. The individual with a little help from friends can heal the wounds. If the prescription seems double strength with the addition of a sexual ingredient, it is only a variant of an old home medicine. That American business and its negation, the left, have come to agree on some points as to how to assuage the discontent is an irony that suggests the potency of bourgeois society. There is no escape, not even for those who, who resist. Society ineluctably coerces everyone to attend to the remaining fragments of self and subjectivity. It is no secret that at least since World War I and increasingly since the Hawthorne experiment at Western Electric in the 1930s, industrial sociology and psychology have turned to studies of small groups and the subjective condition of the workers. In concentrating on the subjective attitude of the workers and not the conditions of the workers, the intent was to increase production. Hugo Munsterberg wrote in 1913 that scientific management sought to organize work so that the waste of energy will be avoided and the greatest increase in efficiency of the industrial enterprise will be reached. This is to be done not by excessive driving of the working men. On the contrary, the heightening of the individual's joy in the work and of the personal satisfaction in one's total life development belongs among the most important indirect agencies of the new scheme. The official statement of the American Management um, Association of 1924 noted, the day when American management can afford to treat the human factors taken for granted has gone by, and today emphasis must be laid on the human factor in commerce and industry, and we must apply to it the same careful study that has been given during the last few decades to materials and machinery. Again, it is not just to equate developments within American industry with those within the American left. Evidently, the concern of the latter with the emotional and psychic individual is not directed toward increasing capitalist production, but if anything, toward transforming it. 
Yet it is the very problem that this political goal degenerates more and more into slogans, externally attached, not internally united with the ongoing praxis. The slogans serve to label political groups and factions, not to mark distinct political projects. The ongoing political praxis is diverted into the exploration of the psychic life of the group, sapping of energy sustained political thought and praxis. Politics becomes an afterthought. It is interesting to note, in fact, that the liberal industrial sociologists and human relations experts who pioneered the sensitivity groups and tea groups in the late 1940s and early 1950s, and which parts of the left fantasized that they had invented some 20 years later, were concerned with exactly this development. One of the original purposes of the tea groups was to train participants in human skills so they could become effective leaders of social change, particularly racial integration in their own communities. Yet to the disappointment of some of the originators, even this limited social goal became lost. I lost my spot. Oh, absorbed by the process of social interaction. The outside and social issues seem less involving and fascinating than the here and now happenings which of necessity focused on personal, interpersonal, and group levels. Emphasis upon organization and community structures in the back home situations of members was also greatly reduced. Attention was diverted to the, inter the interpersonal events occurring between trainer and members, or between members, and in varying degrees, group events. The convergence from contrasting directions on the importance of the subject as an emotional and psychic entity points to a real development of society, not as the apologists would have it. The society has fulfilled the basic material needs and is moving on to the higher reaches of liberation, but the reverse. Domination is reaching the inner depths of men and women. The last preserves of the autonomous individual are under siege. Today, human relations are irregulars and seconds at the closing days of the warehouse sale of life. The lines form because everyone knows the rest is junk. All that remains are the remains. In any case, talk of satisfaction of the basic material needs is obscene, given the world's absolute need and suffering that serve as the means for such satisfaction. Within this context of grim necessity, freedom too is grim. The desperate flight from the specter of misery. The smile buttons seek to chase from mind the daily carnage and drudgery. One smiles because the living are sad. The flaunted sensitivity survives only by an iron indifference to the general deprivation and brutalization. The whole program, in brief, is grin and bear it. The subjectivity that surfaces everywhere, be it in the form of human relations, peak experiences, and so on, is a response to its demise, because the individual is being administered out of existence, and with it individual experience and emotions. It takes more effort than ever to keep the last fragments alive. Psychic suffocation haunts the reified. The desperation of men and women, for good reason, increases visibly. Today, the process of reification is a storm tide, and the human subject is locked in the basement. The frantic search for authenticity, experience, emotions, is the pounding on the ceiling as the water rises. Within the social and psychological thought that has arisen to explain and respond to these developments, psychoanalysis shows its strength. It demystifies the claims to liberated values, sensitivities, emotions, by tracing them to a repressed psychic, social, and biological dimension. In a period of renewed idealism, talk of ego conflict, moral problems, value conflict, it is unfashionably materialistic. It keeps to the pulse of the psychic underground. As such, it is more capable of grasping the intensifying social unreason that the conformist psychologies repress and forget. The barbarism of civilization itself the barely suppressed misery of the living, the madness that haunts society. Critical theory as critique and negative psychoanalysis resists social amnesia and the conformist ideologies. It is loyal both to an objective notion of truth 
into a past which the present still suffers.